So now we're going to have to answer the question, what if the auxiliary equation gives us complex roots? Okay, how are we going to deal with that? Now, the way that I'm going to tackle it is we're going to look at it via an example. And we're going to look at solving d2y by dx squared, take away 4 dy by dx, plus 13y equals 0. And we're going to see if we can follow through the logic of uh, what we've been doing up to this point and see if we can adapt it to this, okay, and see what the end result needs to be. Okay, so first of all, the auxiliary equation. That would be m squared take away 4m plus 13 equals 0. So now I want to solve that quadratic equation. So I'm going to go to my quadratic solver. 1, oh, 1, uh, minus 4 and 13. So 2 plus or minus 3i. OK, so we've got our complex roots. Right, so next, uh, because of what we've seen up to this point, uh, we might assume that the solutions, or this general solution rather, to the differential equation would be of the form y equals some constant c1 times e to the power of one of these roots, so 2 plus 3i times by x, then plus some constant e to the power of 2 minus 3i times some x. Okay? That seems like a logical step to use that, okay, given that we know that C1e to the power of uh, one of the roots of the auxiliary equation times x should be uh, one of our solutions, okay? So it seems reasonable to assume that. Okay, now this isn't in a particularly nice format, so let's see if we can rewrite it in another way, okay? So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as y is equal to c1 e to the 2x times by e to the 3i x. Okay, and I'm going to split this one up as well, c2 e to the 2x e to the minus 3i x. Okay, right. Now, of those two, you can see that we've got this common factor of e to the 2x, so I can pull that outside and factorise this. So e to the 2x can come out the front, and I'll have c1 e to the power of... Now, I'm going to write it as 3x in a bracket times i, okay? Then plus c2 e to the power of minus 3x in a bracket times i. Close the big bracket. Now, at this point, we want to recall Euler's formula, okay? So, Euler's formula said that e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. So, I'm going to use that. So, where I've got the i, the theta in this case is 3x, and the theta in this case is minus 3x. So let's see what we get. y is equal to e to the 2x times by. Then I'm going to get c1 times cosine of 3x plus i, well, plus c2, sorry, not c, not c2, c1 times uh, i sine of 3x. And then from here, we're going to get plus C2 cosine of minus 3x plus C2 times i sine of minus 3x. Right. OK. So next stage of what I want to do is I would want to be able to group the C, well, the uh, real parts together and then have the imaginary parts over here. Now, 
Cosine of minus 3x, because cosine is an even function, cosine of minus 3x is just cosine of 3x. So let's write that down next. So we've got the C1 cosine 3x. And from here, I'm going to have the plus C2 cosine of 3x. We've got this term here, the C1i sine 3x. We're going to leave that alone for the moment. And this one, sine of minus 3x, well, that's minus sine of 3x because sine is odd. So minus C2i sine of 3x. OK. So we've got this bit here. So I can factor the cosine 3x out of those two terms and have C1 plus C2 cosine of 3x. And here, we're going to have uh, C1 take away C2, because they've both got a factor of i sine 3x, i sine 3x. Close the bracket. Now, at this stage, we've got the C1 and C2, which is just a constant. And we've also got C1 take away C2 times i, which is another constant. OK? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to let a be c1 plus c2. And we're going to let b be the c1 take away c2 times by i. And that's going to leave me with y is equal to e to the 2x times a cosine 3x plus b sine 3x. And this is the general form of the, well, the general solution of this differential equation. This is the one that we want to hop straight to. OK, so where we've got the real part of the complex root of the auxiliary equation being the coefficient of x and the imaginary part being the coefficient of x inside cosine and sine. And the a and the b are constants that we would have to, if we wanted to find those that, we'd have to have two, part, two bits of information about our curve. OK, so two initial conditions. Now, a and b here, this is the, this is the bit that's the kicker, right? a and b here are going to be considered real for all the problems that we consider. Now, you might be looking at that going, oh, that seems a bit odd because up here I've said that b is equal to c1 take away c2i. How can I guarantee that a and b are both real? Well, the reason why I'm saying they're real is because the situations that we're going to deal with are going to be the, going to be the fact that we're going to start with problems that are in the real world that's going to have real um, initial conditions, OK? So scratch that bit about the real world. But the fact that we are going to use have real uh, initial conditions and boundary conditions, consequently, I want to get real solutions coming through, OK? Effectively, what we're doing here is we're kind of dipping our toe into complex numbers in order to get this into a nice form so that we can have a nice real set of solutions at the end. OK, now, if that's not convincing enough for you, right, because if, if we had uh, complex um, initial conditions, then, of course, A and B would have to be complex as well. OK, so if we just take a look uh, a and B, so this is for me kind of like trying to convince people a little bit further. OK, let's say um, I wanted to figure out what C1 and C2 would have to be if A and B were real. OK, so what I could do is I could divide both sides by I here and have B over I is equal to C1 take away C2. And I could call that equation 1 and that equation 2. If I add together equation 1 and equation 2. It's going to knock out the C2s. They're gone. I'm going to have A plus B over I 
is equal to two lots of C1. Now, dividing by I is the same, I could just multiply top and bottom by I, and I'll get BI over minus one. So that's minus BI. So A minus BI is equal to two C1. So that means that half of A minus BI is equal to C1. Okay. Now that I've got C1, I can substitute that into one of the others. So it probably makes sense if I substitute it in to this one, okay, then I would get A is equal to, so this is substituting into equation 1, uh, C1, which is the half uh, A take away a half BI that I've got there, plus the C2. So take half A from both sides, add the half BI to both sides, and so C2 has got to be one half of A plus BI. So you can see that C1 is that, C2 is that. So if A and B are real, okay, and I want them to be real in the situations that I've got to deal with, then C1 and C2 have to be complex conjugates of one another. And that's one of the uh, consequences of this, that because of the situations I want to deal with, at the start with initial conditions, and I want to keep those real, the consequence of that is that these uh, coefficients here, well, these uh, constants, rather, uh, would have to be complex conjugates in order for that to be the case, okay, in order for A and B to be real down here. That's one of the algebraic extensions that comes through from this. Essentially, what you need to know at this stage is if you get complex roots, you should be able to dive straight from that line straight down to that one to write down the general solution of your differential equation.